Department of Agriculture. Thank you so much for coming out today. Um, we wanted to basically direct, do some direct outreach to the press. There's been some information circulating in the last week or two about honeybees in Nevada, and we wanted to kind of help set the record straight and you know provide some information from the state entomologist, Jeff Knight. He's basically the state expert in this, and um, thank you for being here, and Jeff's gonna say a few words. He's got a little presentation. We have time for interviews afterward, and hope, hope to not take too much of your time today, it's about a half hour. So. Okay, this is just a quick little video out of, uh, um, actually our director's yard, um, and he's a person who uses and practices what we consider integrated pest management. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can see there's, there's lots of honeybees flying around in there. Uh, no real real shortage there. Let me close this. So what we're going to talk about real quick, I, you know, our big concern, what seems to hit everything is, is uh, uh, the plight of honeybees and how it relates to pollination. And that if we don't have honeybees, we're not going to get pollination. Just a real quick definition, pollination, of course, is just moving pollen from one, the female part, or the male parts of the, the plant to the female parts. One key here is sometimes I see that people talk about, well, if the plants don't get pollinated, uh, pollination has nothing to do with plant health itself. It only has to do with the reproduction of the, of the plant. There's a couple ways this happens. Uh, wind is a big one, all of our grasses, uh, conifer trees, deciduous trees, a number of our crops uh, are all wind pollinated. Uh, so they're going to get pollinated whether there's bees or not, okay? Uh, there's a few that are water pollinated. Then we get down into animals that pollinate. Of course, man, we can do that ourselves. Uh, bats is one method of pollination. Birds is another. Um, however, the biggest one is insects. Uh, and up here I have a case of insect pollinators. They fall into two classes. There's what we call active pollinators and passive pollinators. Active pollinators are things like bees that go out and actually collect pollen and either use it as a food source or to stock their nests uh, for, for larval uh, development and stuff like that. Passive pollination are things like uh, the butterfly you see in the picture on the wall over there, lots of beetles, lots of wasps, things that just land on the flower, primarily probably for the nectar, uh, sometimes to actually feed on the pollen, uh, but they get the pollen on their body and they move it uh, to another plant. Now, honeybees are the one big one we're concerned with. Uh, the primary honeybee that we have around here, we call the European honeybee. Um, honeybees are, are not native to North America. Uh, they originated in Europe and Asia. Uh, and there's a number of varieties of them. Uh, the one variety or subspecies that we have a lot of concern with in Nevada is the Africanized honeybee down south. Uh, in southern Nevada, it's, it's lines about up to the uh, uh, northern Clark County line right now is where it's gotten to in Nevada. But this, a few years ago, this thing started called colony collapse disorder. Colony collapse disorder, or CCD, is something where people started noticing, these big beekeepers started noticing they were losing uh, 30, 40, I had one guy tell me 50% of his colonies, okay? Um, I think the only thing that, that uh, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. What are the symptoms? Basically. Uh, colony collapse disorder is where the bees just disappear. They never come back to the colony. They go look at a colony uh, after the winter and there, or early spring and there's no bees in it. There's no signs of anything having happened. There's no dead bees uh, laying outside. If we had a pesticide kill, you see dead bees all over the outside of the colony. Or if you have diseases, you'll see dead bees all over the outside of the colony. No, and here we talk about 25 to 33 percent loss. A key factor, though, is that normal losses in honeybee production is probably 15 to 25 percent. 
So it's not that big of increase. Uh, one of the things we've also seen, uh, especially with these large beekeepers, they may lose 30 or 40 percent of their colonies, but they can be back up because of the, the honeybee's ability to reproduce and, and generate new queens. They can be back up in, in full strength within several months usually. Okay. Um, this is hard to read. Some of the original suspected causes, uh, cell phones, insecticides, that there's still darts being thrown at insecticides. It doesn't have as big a role in colony collapse disorder as originally thought of. It has a role in other uh, problems with um, honeybees, cold winters. Uh, the biggest really current thoughts, there's a virus. Uh, or several viruses that are causing problems. Uh, the biggie really comes down to poor health. In other words, management by the beekeeper of the bees. Providing enough food in winter time, providing the proper food in winter time, uh, those types of things. Uh, we do have mites that are a definite issue with, uh, and they interact with the viruses, uh, but also, the beekeepers treat the colonies for mites. They use an insecticide to treat the colonies for mites, and there seems to be a lot of overdosing of, of the insecticides trying to keep the mites down. Uh, genetics is playing a role in this also. Uh, in North America, the bee stock, if you understand how bees reproduce, the bee stock tends to be kind of uh, all very, very similar genetically, okay? Uh, within, within the uh, European honeybee varieties. A big thing that has happened recently is a big concern about pollinators and pollinators in urban areas. Uh, this is probably the biggest thing I deal with. Uh, the first question is why? Honeybees are a very important part of pollinating a number of our crops, things like almonds, um, some of the uh, vegetable and fruit crops, uh, very important in doing so. However, with this concern about honeybees dying off, and I'll assure you that they aren't going to go extinct, okay? Uh, they have, like I said, a fantastic ability to reproduce. Um, we have actually more beekeepers right now uh, in and colonies of bees in Reno and in Las Vegas than we've ever had before. Uh, so there's lots of honeybees out there. But what needs to be pollinated in a city? Uh, a backyard garden, maybe a few fruit, fruit trees. It's not a crop type situation. Uh, we put, a, we put a, a colony of bees in a urban setting and there's all sorts of issues that we create. Uh, one is usually with the neighbors. Probably the biggest call I get uh, there's two calls I get, can I keep honeybees, and two, my neighbor's got honeybees, how do I get rid of them, okay? And it's because normally there's poor management of those honeybees. If they're properly fed and properly watered and they have uh, everything available to them, they're not going to cause problems uh, to the neighbors. I had one case out in, in Red Rock, and you'd think that's not in a really urban area, if you will. But the beekeeper decided to put his colonies right next to the fence, so it was closer to the water source, who was the neighbor's pond, but in between the neighbor's pond and the water source was the horse corrals. And these bees were causing problems with the horses. So we need to think about uh, what's happening with our neighbors and stuff. Um, also, Anybody that wants to keep bees, the state does not regulate whether people can have bees or not, uh, honeybees, uh, but there are several municipalities and, and then when you get down into uh, community regulations, there's a number of community regulations that actually prevent people from having honeybees. Uh, so we, we need to watch that. Uh, like I said, what's a risk? Uh, you definitely have, can have some irate neighbors. Uh, in southern Nevada, We've had a lot of beekeepers that don't realize the work that goes in to keeping a colony of bees and keeping it properly. And in southern Nevada, within a fairly short period of time, 
that colony will become Africanized. And basically, you're going to end up with uh, a colony that could end up uh, stinging somebody or attacking somebody. Uh, you know, a good, healthy European colony is, is fairly docile, but uh, you get down south and we definitely have the problems down there. So there's some real issues of why do we have to have honeybees within a, a city limits or within an urban area. You also got people say, well, I need pollination. A, a good, strong colony of honeybees, a honeybee will forage up to two miles away from its colony for pollen and nectar. So it doesn't actually take a lot of colonies um, to, to pollinate or to service an area with, with honeybees. What are all our alternatives to this? And again, we're talking about all different pollinators. North America has between somewhere 4,000, 5,000 species of native bees. In Nevada, we figure we've got somewhere around uh, 2,500 to 3,000 species of native bees. These are all excellent pollinators. In fact, a number of them are much better actually pollinators than honeybees are. Uh, they actually do a better job of, of it. Uh, one nice thing about them, most of our native uh, and uh, naturalized uh, bees like this uh, don't sting. They have stingers, but for the most part, uh, they're, they're not a social colony, uh, so they don't, you don't have a problem with stinging with them. Most of them are what we call cavity nesters. This is a leaf cutter bee. Uh, you can see why she's such a good pollinator, is that's pollen all on the underside of her abdomen. And when she moves across the flower, instead of packing it in little packets like honeybees do on their legs, she moves across the, fl the flower and distributes that pollen much better. Um, these things, uh, oh, you can, uh, these are some examples of cavity nesting blocks that we can put out to promote uh, some of these native pollinators. Uh, and you just put them out in your yard They'll find them, they'll start coming to them. Uh, we can, I can even see evidence of leaf cutter bees working out in our courtyard right here uh, as far as uh, uh, being active. So they'll, they'll find their sites when they need to. Uh, these are a couple of the, the five uh, or so species that are heavily managed of leaf cutter bees uh, for various crops already. The alfalfa leaf cutter bee along with the al alkali bee, which isn't a leaf cutter, are the primary pollinators for alfalfa seed that we grow here in Nevada. Uh, so honey bees are kind of put on alfalfa only for the fact that the honey is a high quality honey uh, coming out of alfalfa. What are our pesticide threats to pollinators? Well, you of course have direct spraying, then you have contaminated pollen and contaminated nectar. That's basically coming from our systemics. Uh, we do have some things happening with a group of pesticide called neonics or the neonicotinoids that are some new systemics that seem to be transferred more than some of our others uh, into the nectar system. And this all varies between the different plants and things like that. There's been some big bee kills in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, uh, there was actually honeybees so far, all these pesticide kills that we have seen or, or have been seen have actually been misuses. In other words, somebody did something that wasn't legal technically when this pesticide was applied. If they, uh, one of the things, um, the one of the solutions we have uh, is education. When we go out and talk to pest control operators. Uh, guys doing these applications, we always talk about not spraying a flowering crop, okay, or a flower, flowering shrub, or otherwise you're going to hurt your pollinators. Um, integrated pest management is basically uh, using pesticides only when necessary. Uh, integrated pest management doesn't mean organic uh, control, or it, organic controls are part of it, but in integrated pest management, you use everything. It's kind of a, almost if you want to call it holistic type approach, it's you try and reduce pesticides your best you can, and pesticides are the last choice. But you do other things like cultural controls and biological controls, uh, those types of things uh, to reach your, your, your goal. And you, like I said, only apply 
uh, as a fact sheet talks about when it's necessary. I talked about we do have educational programs uh, both with the public and uh, the pest control operators where we promote this and talk about pollinator protection. Uh, there's some really good websites about pollinator protection that was on your, uh, your fact sheet. Last is regulation. Now EPA has started uh, changing some of the labels on some of these pesticides that they're having problems with uh, to try and, and prevent this um, the problem with pollinators. And it's not just honeybees. The bee kills in Oregon and Washington were all bumblebees. Uh, so it's, it's looking at all the pollinators out there that we're trying to help. Uh, our, as far as uh, some other regulations, uh, Oregon and Washington, or at least I think Oregon, maybe Washington also, is, have banned actually certain pesticides. We have not taken that approach. We've taken the approach of we'll follow whatever EPA feels is appropriate as far as changing regulations on pesticides as far as uh, pollinators go. There's some things you can do to encourage pollinators. The biggest is providing habitat, uh, nice flowering, provide nesting sites uh, like this stuff, reduce pesticide use like we already talked about. Timing of applications is very important. That's part of integrated pest management again and the placement of pesticides. You know, putting it where the pollinators aren't going to get into it will go a long way to helping them. That was National Pollinator Week. I got a couple of the other uh, posters up here. Uh, just a quick shot of some bumblebees. Are in, we have about eight or nine species of bumblebees in Nevada. Uh, bumblebees are one of the pollinators. Actually, for a lot of greenhouse crops, they're the primary pollinator uh, used in those crops. And there we go. Okay. Questions, answers, 